Hey everybody, what's going on? Zach Grant here with U of I Extension in Cook County here at the Sosuko Urban Egg Demonstration Site here in Matson in Southern Cook County. Just coming to you with some updates about what's going on. Uh, it's the end of October. The outdoor season is really kind of winding down and we've transitioned to the uh, winter production season in here. So I'm just actually doing one of the last successions of spinach direct seeding here in the high tunnel. I thought I would just, you know, kind of show you around a little bit, see what's going on here. Uh, at this time of the year as we transition from from one season to the other so gotten a lot of rain here over the past uh, several days uh, but it's nice and, and relatively dry or, or controlled level of moisture here in the high tunnel so yeah let's take a look and see what we got going on here i'm still harvesting a few cherry tomatoes not too many we have a few outside we haven't actually gotten the first frost of the year yet but still as you can see harvesting a little bit still inside here Like I'm saying, uh, like I'm saying, they still haven't actually had the first technical frost of the year. Typically, we would have had it already. It looks like sometime next week, first week of November, we might get down to 32 at night. So I'm going to be doing some stuff to prepare and overwinter some of the stuff here at the site. So we'll take a look, look at that a little bit later. But I figured we'd just do a little quick little tour in here, just try to keep it short, just to keep you updated on what's going on here at the site. All right, let's go ahead and check that out. All right, so here we are in the high tunnel. And as you can see uh, from the last videos, this is the final remaining warm season tomatoes we have in here. So I kept a, a couple of these vines still just to kind of see how far we could push ripening. Uh, you see we do have you know, some clusters still ripening, still have some green fruit. You know, As the day length decreases and, and warmth decreases, uh, we start to, you know, even if we can get these plants to survive colder temperatures and light frost, they're not going to ripen up like they are uh, during the normal season. So even though we can extend the season with these tomatoes, both early and a bit late, uh, you know, really economically, I would probably have cleared these out already and, you know, planted this last little bit of bed. But because this is kind of a research and experimentation farm, I figured I would I would leave these in here to see how far we can actually push these uh, tomatoes into the fall. So I started I started harvesting these cherries from these plants. These are probably some of the earliest, sometime in the first or second week of June. So this being the end of October, you know that really does give us truly four to almost five months of of ripe tomato season inside of a, even an unheated structure like this. So. With protected culture, you really can push the, the growing season pretty significantly. Sorry, I have to snack on, on that picked tomato. So, in here we actually have, you know, quite a few of succession plantings already established. Here I put in, we did some transplanting in here back in September. So I believe we put these lettuce transplants in. Uh, September 17th. These aren't doing great. These are transplants that were actually held for a long time when I put them in the ground. And these are actually, I think, from Gotham Greens, some leftovers. So these are in these uh, little rock wool, not rock wool, uh, peat cubes. And they just really haven't taken off the way some of this other stuff has taken off. Uh, these scallions being about six weeks old at this point, maybe a little behind where they should be. Uh, one of the things we actually did in here that we don't normally do or wouldn't normally do is we had this crop, I'm sorry, this tunnel completely planted with warm season vining fruit crops. And we had drip irrigation, actually two lines of drip irrigation on each bed inside this tunnel. And that was on an irrigation schedule. And what I failed to anticipate because... My previous work with tunnels, high tunnels, have been with movable tunnels. What I failed to anticipate was how much water I had actually applied throughout the season to these beds. So these beds are actually very moist when it was time to flip these beds for winter planting. So not being able to till, incorporate amendments, really broad fork that much. I did broad fork a little bit. What I decided to do was 
an impromptu experiment with the leaf compost that we have here. So rather than trying to till the beds and or prepare them uh, with any sort of tillage or soil disturbance because it was too wet, what I did instead was this broad fork and then bring in about three to four inches of this leaf compost. And we put this directly on top of the broad fork beds and planted right into it, whether it be transplants or direct seedings like you see here. And we're doing some longer term sort of research and inquiry into the use of compost on urban farms. And this is a common practice to, to use really thick layers of more of a maybe high carbon, lower nitrogen based compost, like a leaf compost, as sort of a, a thick layer of organic material compost slash mulch on the surface, and then planting directly into that or through that potentially in the case of transplant. So, so a lot of growers have had success with this. So I wanted to experiment with this and kind of look at some of the variables. One of the variables I was concerned with was the nitrogen availability of this compost. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio of this compost is relatively high, close to 25 to one, which is at the very upper end of what we would call a, a cured or stabilized compost. But the nitrogen levels were, were decent. In fact, I did what's called the saturated media extract test as part of our pilot project and tested this compost to see what the you know, kind of short-term nitrogen and potassium availability was in this compost. And it was actually quite high. The pH was, I think, relatively neutral, and the nitrate levels were really high. So what I decided to do was not provide any additional supplemental fertility in this mulch and just plant directly into it. And with the exception of these lettuce transplants, that, like I was saying, were probably stunted and a bit old, and a little bit with the scallions that you see here, everything else is actually established and is growing pretty nicely. So these kale transplants, uh, this is some... Uh, endive or escarole, I'm sorry, actually leafy chicory transplants, some multi-seeded planted lettuce transplants, and then we have collards, kale, chard, and then a lot of our direct seeding that you see here. All of these have actually germinated and established pretty nicely, and we're getting good growth here. In fact, you know, these direct seedings of these baby salad grains, actually that's not a good example, that is the Hansai and chrysanthemum. This, this five-star lettuce mix right here, actually, so that was seeded on October 17th. So we've already cut this one, so this is already, you know, matured within that 28 to 38 day scenario. Over here, we have some of the later plantings. These are planted on October 1st. So these are approaching a month old, and we're less than a week away from them being a month old. And you can see they're not quite ready to harvest, but that also signifies, without going into great detail, the importance of planting some crops a little bit earlier because the day length is decreasing rapidly. And we will get a little bit more growth here, uh, but some of these later plantings and these very last plantings I'm doing we're going to get minimal growth and we're experimenting with some planting dates in here. So more to come on the winter planting, but we're well underway in here. What you see here hanging, just a really quick update on this, is the final harvest and now dry, drying, in the process of drying, a CBD a hemp, floral hemp project that we're working with, the variety trial. So we were looking at three different varieties, uh, Florence, BAOX, and Silver Lining. Uh, as part of this larger initiative with the commercial ag extension team looking at uh, CBD varieties. We've already tested some of these in some preliminary, preliminary testing of the THC levels to make sure they were within compliance and, and they are. Uh, more to come on that. So right now we actually just are kind of trying to, we harvested the plants and we're attempting to dry them in this kind of bulk method. It's not going to work super well but I didn't have, I don't have too much drying space here at the demo site. So really, you know, we're not going to really be processing this or utilizing any of this uh, CBD flour. So I'm not super worried about the end result quality, but we are going to send some of this off to get tested uh, to see what the CBD levels are and the THC levels are to see if um, uh, they're in, in decent compliance. 
So this was an interesting project to be a part of this year. Uh, we were growing them in, in container bags along the south row of the high tunnel in here. I don't know that we'll uh, continue to partner uh, with the variety trials with the CBD hemp. It's, it, I think there is potential for growing them in bags in controlled environments like this, particularly if, if you're a boutique sort of um, CBD floral grower. But for the big picture research that we're trying to do here, I don't know if it quite fits in. Uh, we'll see if this crop becomes more widely adopted by urban farmers. I know some urban farmers are investing heavily in hemp. So, you know, maybe we'll, we'll revisit this at a later date or if we can build another tunnel uh, to specifically grow CBD hemp in at some point, we'll, we'll consider that. So what I'm doing actually right now is finishing the second to last succession planting. So typically we like to finish our direct seedings of the cold hardy crops like spinach right around now. Actually, probably last week is typically when I finish direct seeding, but I wanted to do a little experimentation to see how far we could push it. So I'm doing a planting this week on 1026, and then I'm gonna do one more the first week of November with spinach in particular, you know, to see how, you know, what the germination rate looks like, and then how much plant growth we get before the day length really decreases to a level where growth is not existing. Typically, that's signified by the 10 hour day length, which is around November 10th at this latitude. So we're about two weeks away from that at this point. So I don't, I expect all of this to germinate and to begin to grow, but I don't expect it to, at least these last plantings, at least my thesis is, I don't expect them to size up, you know, the, this size of spinach that you see over here. If you have a tunnel and you're doing winter plantings and you want to harvest this size uh, leafy grains or spinach all winter long, you need to get these plantings established a little bit earlier than this. So that's one thing we're kind of looking at to see how far we can push direct seeding uh, in, in the tunnel in particular. So I'm using this Jang Cedar right now. Uh, the Jang Cedar is a really cool cedar. I'm a big fan of it. In fact, I probably will stop using most of the other cedars that I use because this is such an efficient cedar. Uh, this spinach right here was actually direct seeded with the Jang cedar. And you can see it, it's pretty uniform, a really good germination and very uniform in spacing relatively. I mean, it takes a little bit of tweaking. All of these beds were planted with the direct cedars. You can see there's a really nice uniformity uh, to using the Jang cedar. It's a little bit expensive, but you know I think you can get them used for a few hundred dollars and new. I think around four to five hundred dollars. So it works with a. There's a series of gear sprockets in here with a chain, and there's a spacing chart based on those sprockets. And then of course there are different roller sizes, so you can kind of see the roller there on the side. And if I can move some of the seat out of the way. It's hard to see right now, but essentially there actually are little holes drilled into these rollers of different sizes. So this one is the LJ24, and this one works really well for this size spinach seed. So this is spinach seed that you see in here. And based on the roller and then the sprocket spacing and chain spacing in this gearbox, that determines with the turn of the wheel the distribution of the seed. So I can kind of move this here. I think I have the setup ready to go. I'm just gonna do actually just a couple feet of planting. But as I move the cedar, okay, it's actually depositing it behind from that hopper right there. So you can see some of the seed falling back off of here, off of the roller. And then it, this furrow actually kind of reapplies the soil in the furrow and this back wheel tamps it down to create this really nice tamp soil seed contact that you see here. So I really like the cedar a lot. Uh, I have other cedar, I have an earthway cedar that I use a lot for cover cropping. Could also use that for, I use that for beans if I'm direct seeding beans. And I also have the pinpoint cedars that are often used for the real tight spacing for, for baby salad greens like you see over here. But this works really well for the baby salad green plantings too. So 
just the accuracy and ease of use, I'm a big fan of, of the Gang Seeder. All right, so we'll end it there. Just wanted to kind of give you some updates about what's going on here at the site, and we will catch everyone next time. Hope your seasons are wrapping up nicely. All right, take it easy.